Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We're waiting for the presence of Mr. Uh, Mayor of Asuncion, Arnaldo Samaniego. He will be in charge of the resolution, which is a municipal interest. With the presence of the chairman of the Global Peace Foundation, Dr. Hang, the 14 former presidents of Latin America that are part of the presidential mission in Latin America. Juan Carlos Wasmosi, former president of Paraguay. Mr. Luis Alberto Lacalle, former president of Uruguay. Mr. Benicio Cerezo, former president of Guatemala. Mr. Raul Cubas, former president of Paraguay. Rafael Angel Calderon, former president of Costa Rica. Carlos Mesa, former president of Bolivia. Alvaro Colon, former president of Guatemala. Gustavo Nonoa, former president of Ecuador. Jorge Valle, former president of Uruguay. Luis. Luis Gonzalez Maki, former president of Paraguay. Jaime Paz Zamora, former president of Bolivia. Laura Chinchilla, former president of Costa Rica. And Polito Mejia, former president of the Dominican Republic. Eduardo Dualde, former president of Argentina. We are here in a very important space with 14 former presidents of Latin America, which constitutes the second summit of the Americas of the presidential mission of Latin America. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to highlight that uh, due to the resolution 2705 of the Asuncion's City Hall, the mayor, Arnaldo Samaniego, says uh, on Article 1st, to declare as a municipal interest the second summit of the presidential mission of Latin America that will be held on the 19, 20, and 21st of this month of this year. Article 2nd, take notes, communicate to who it corresponds. Arnaldo Samaniego, major of the city hall. The economist, Mr. Arnaldo Samaniego, to the former president of the Republic of Costa Rica, Laura Chinchilla. Ladies and gentlemen, this plenary will be moderated by the by Mr. Olinda Salio, a citizen builder, ambassador of the Red Cross in Guatemala, very active in political causes, formative environmental and social causes. She currently works as the executive director of the Foundation for Center. Central America integration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a privilege to be sharing this afternoon with you. Apart from this small summit of the UN, 
uh, with all you who represent all the brother countries. Of course, it's hard in such a short time to build so much in a space with 14 former presidents. But let's try to make this a conversation so we can all learn from the experiences, testimonies. And as the slogan says of the that testimony, that leadership, and how can the president put this uh, for the service of the region. But I'd like to say to Mr. President of La Calle, one of the founding members, to say a few words that he had, he has prepared for us. Uh, welcome, an applause for him. Senor. Mr. President of the Foundation Global Peace, Mr. President of the Presidential Committee, uh, Mr. Cerezo, and my dear friend Olinda Salgueiro of the Foundation Kipula, I'd like to greet Margaret and Juan Carlos Sanchez of the Foundation Zambrano of Miami, which are here with us today. They're very excited to do things. We have done things this year in Miami with the generous hospitality of Jose Zambrano regarding these topics, and we hope that the relationship will be very fruitful in the future. Last Sunday, who went to Moss, you will remember that the Evangelium was one of the deepest and profound regarding what was said, which is the uh, Evangelium of the Talents. I will ask for you as much as I have given you. And we qualify these people regarding on what they have done and what the Lord has given us. Don't uh, don't be scared. I'll, I will not go into religious uh, aspects, maybe in the future, but not now. But I think that the presidential mission seeks to fulfill how much do we have to do in order, in comparison to what we have. All of us, as chief of states, we have been at the helm of the administrations. We have lived the circumstances that we had to face in the region, in the world, and in our countries. But when you embrace this sort of activities with commitment and depth, you're always left with a will of doing more. So that's why some of us decided to go to the Senate, to the Academy. So you have a will to do more. Bless this will because this is what allows you to live. If you don't have a project, you don't live. You could go around life, but you won't be living. And that is how in this blessed Warren land, with the support of the Dream Nation and the Dr. Tamirano and all his people, and a lot of people who gave their best, the idea of the presidential mission was born. I'm saying this is not the circle of presidents, this is not an academy, this is not an institution, this is n nothing like that which is already known and is very common around the world. This is a group of 14 or 15 people that have had the honor of serving for the state as head of the government. These people are at the disposal of whoever wants to use that that is not being bought in the store, which is experience. And the experience should be much more expensive than gold and silver. It can't be transmitted. And there is n nothing better than listening to a person who made a mistake 
and try not to make the same mistake again. Or perhaps listen to a person who succeeded to try to improve that success. This is what we're trying to offer. Nothing more, nothing less. This is the special thing that the presidential mission has. It does not pretend to give lectures. We're not teachers or professors. But if tomorrow we have a legislative electoral issue of public companies and modifications, the, the doctor can give you a hand of the things that we have to do and things that we don't or we can't do. Any of those topics don't have specialists. We do have practitioners. And we're asking you to take advantage of this circumstance. We're offering ourselves to those who want to receive us, whether it's the government, it's a university, a political party, or maybe another study center. All of them are invited to choose the presidential mission. And the presidential mission will uh, finish the list that will be about what topics can we talk about. In the judicial power or the judicial branch, we have experts of first level in the Supreme Court of Justice. We also have the deficit in organization wise of political parties. We don't want to teach, we want to convey an experience. We want to convey or transmit what we had to deal with. The bitter is, the more experience we can get out of things. So just like that, my friends, I just wanted to point out that the scope that the mission, the presidential mission has. The title of this plenary says Leadership for the Trans National Transformation, Integrity and Innovation. I think that we can offer integrity with the experience and also the capacity of innovating, which oftentimes was a sign of a government. Maybe at the moment or at the time wasn't well understood, but through time we were given the um, we were right. So we're at your disposal to be a peace instrument. We're at your disposal to be instrument of progress. And those who work for peace are uh, sons of God. Thank you very much, President Lacalle, for that speech. And well, as Latin America, we are in a time where we have more periods of democratic governments, but there are lots of differences in political sectors, in academics, and entrepreneurial. So democracy could be in crisis. Beyond that, that has to do with ideologies. And then I'll also be asking some of you to answer certain questions. But I'd like for you to focus on that leadership in order to transform the national reality and taking into account that we have to see ourselves as uh, a group. And I'll address uh, Mr. Calderon. What do you think are the background problems that put democracy in risk in Latin America? Well, first of all, I have the pleasure to be with you here. I want to thank the Global Peace Foundation and the President Presto Kum for carrying out this initiative and for giving us the support that's necessary so there can be a voice, a voice 
of those people who were trusted by uh, their people at a certain time and those who were elected democratically. The biggest problem that we have, to my opinion, Olinda, is the situation of poverty that most of our people are in. In Latin America, we're having a situation that's difficult regarding poverty. As long as we don't know how to answer the desire of our people, the desire of a better life through the democratic system, then w the democratic system is in peril. A few hours ago, we were talking among ourselves about what Latin America was a few years back. I had the chance 35 years ago to direct with the uh, Mr. President Carazo of that time the foreign policy. All those years back, we were nations that were governed by a president, a civilian president, who was elected democratically. The rest of the nations were under dictatorship. And then there was an amazing change in our people. Even here, we're being represented by govern by people from the government that were elected democratically. I'm saying that Cerezo is is the the one with most seniority. Is he's not the oldest because he was elected in 1986. Now Chinchilla was elected in 2010. She's the youngest of all. There's not a single doubt about that. But how beautiful it is to be able to say that we're here in a lapse of 34 years in a Latin America that's quite different. But if that Latin America that has democracy does not respond to the wishes and to the poverty problems that we're having, if it doesn't respond with a better education in order to uh, overcome poverty, we are putting in danger our democracy. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And that risk of democracy also leads people to pull away from the politics. If you ask young people nowadays if they want to get involved in politics, uh, you'll probably get an answer saying no, because politics for them is something so dirty that it's it's not worth getting involved in. Mr. President, you're also characterized by bonding with uh, the young people. How do you think we can motivate uh, a participation? How can we get politics with a capital P to make it an instrument to transform the reality of our countries? Thank you, Olina. Thank you, all of you here in this room. Thanks to the former president. Every day we're more people. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of participating in this meeting. Today in the Mayan calendar is hash, which is a symbol of liberty. And the Mayan conditions in that time said that the leaders should have a tihash on their hands to lead their people. And that liberation in these golden times, I'd like to touch upon a point to reflect. I had my first computer when I was 32 years old. My granddaughter had her first one when she was two years old, her first tablet. Latin America is in conditions of having its century. It's in ideal conditions to be that continent that is a producer, a seller. We have a capacity of producing food 
It's amazing. These areas will be the ones that will provide more food and food will be a strategic point of humanity. And this reflection of young people is that that gap, generational b breach between my father and, and I was the color television. We can't even begin to describe what is the difference between the generations. Latin America has another characteristic, is the youngest continent, is the continent that has the biggest amount of youth and with a lot of diversity. My reflection is that I believe that our generations that had computers almost when we were about to become grandparents, we should leave, we should let the Latin American youth t to define their future. And just as Mr. Lacalle said to our generations, we're just here to provide advice but not directions. Latin America that we had to deal with is completely different to what it is now. Today, we're in this wonderful country, Paraguay. I have the privilege to, be, to come here very often. And I have met such a special people. In Guatemala, uh, it was the Easter flower uh, in the belt of America. Paraguay is the heart of the South. Everything that's good and everything that's bad will go through Paraguay to connect with Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia, Peru, etc. This wonderful country that has a very low population density has amazing opportunities. And I see simple people, just like we have in our country in the 60s, where you could even walk freely around the streets where the, the houses did not have locks, where for the first time in 14 years I've walked without security and felt happy as a young man. And I think that that youth, that Latin American youth, is our greatest treasure. And if that youth is not taken care of, if we do not protect it from dictatorships, from wars, uh, like the, the case of so many dead people in Guatemala. If we give this to the new generation, Latin America will go backwards. We have to go forward. Latin America is having new models of government. We have to study them. We have to know why they are succeeding or failing. And the former presidents, we have great experience and we can say a lot of things. There is no image to look after. We've had an, an experience of what it's like to rule a country. And that richness, which I didn't want to mention this morning because I was uh, overwhelmed by hearing my colleagues, the message that I'd like to give is that the youth of Latin America deserves to design, build, and to see its future and we should provide advice when we're asked to but the factor of success of Latin America is the youth young people because this situation is not the same young ones nowadays don't have the same privilege of having lunch with their parents of uh, listening to who was the one who won the boxing match listening to the radio or by finding out about the punch that one boxer gave to another or threw to another on the paper. So through integration and through lots of work things can be achieved but if the young people are not 
behind us, well, will not succeed. Thank you very much, President Colón. Well, the demographic average, which is uh, young population, the youngest population is in Guatemala with 21 years old, and the oldest is in Uruguay with 34 years old. But this is a very important range. Mr. Wasmosi, you wanted to uh, say something? Si bien. Even though the circumstances and the moments are ever-changing, I wanted to coincide with Mr. Calderon that if in our democracy we don't find solutions for the needs of our people, especially for the mind, for mine, which is ignorant, those vices and, and, and bad things will effect and the people will try to elect one dictator. So we have to see that strength that democracy needs. In that sense, I'd like to express that uh, to my criteria, the base of democracy is justice. I would like to get the input or experience of all these president how was the confirmation of the Supreme Court of Justice in their countries? The development, the difficulties here in Paraguay, we're having those difficulties. I want to say that I, I started as a civilian president with a new constitution, but to my criteria, there is still a part where the Council goes to the Congress and the Congress goes to the President so there can be one member of each part. A President told me how lucky you are to make a court that is adjusted to you and I told him that we Paraguayans have little political culture. If we take all the best men, I'm not saying that we're going to grow democracy will not grow due to the lack of political culture. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have to be cautious, and I'm telling this for the current governments, accept the experience that we are providing you. I understand that the circumstances and the cases were different, just as uh, the president said, but what is lacking is that transmission of experience. The presidents are always thinking that they know everything, that they don't need any advice. We're here just to say things and we want for you to listen to us. And if it's good, maybe you can apply the things that we did right and if we made mistakes, try to avoid those. Thank you very much. Well, in such a short time, you can see that there have been several subjects uh, youth, education, democracy as a political system. And I'd like to ask Mr. President Jaime Paz, the other day when I was in a meeting with Don Enrique Garcia, who is the director of the uh, Latin American Bank of Development, Don Enrique was saying that we shouldn't put all the countries in the same basket. And there were several references talking about some of the positive things. For example, Bolivia has one of the biggest indigenous population. How the inc inclusion of ethnicity is working in your country. Alina, thank you very much for the words. Thank you very much for being patient enough to listen to us. But I like, as a part of the responsibility of the former presidents, I'd like to address the challenge of presenting new paradigms, new utopies. I think our continent is experiencing all these problems due to lack of paradigms and utopies. If there is 
an inheritance that we must give or or a, or a message is the utopia is to try to seek new horizons. We can give them new paradigms. And I want to say that the first time I was invited to this sort of event, which was organized by the Global Peace Foundation and the Institute of Desired Country, I said to Brazil that had the same issues, things are working in a way that both the extraordinary ad, uh, scientific advancement and technological advancement and the values that the economy is giving us about competitiveness, the safety issues, security issues uh, that are generating wars, for example, now in the Middle East, I was saying that we are affecting the values of humanity. I'm saying that all the values are being taken into account, are not being taken into account. And I'm saying that I'm not losing the hope that even though there is bad use of technology and there is also bad use of spiritual values. I was saying that I expect that the 21st century can be the century where that love can be the cutting edge technology. And when I say love, utopia, it's because this is one of the most transcendental values th that we have. I think everyone that's here, we're all believers, or at least most of you. And I think that our belief, our moral uh, perception of love, it's important. Now, of course, the problem is that love it should be the cutting edge technology and we have to make the 21st century see that the problem is that love we know how it affects human relationships for example in couples we know how uh, love can be can affect uh, the religion but what doesn't exist is how love can be set in the political development, economical development, and social development of a country and a nation. And I have to tell you that I try to seek the help of a Bolivian young one who gave his life for uh, the Bolivian democracy. His name was Pasamora, who died when he was 25 years old. He was my brother. He was like a brother. And in his writings, I found a concept, and I'd like to say this to, the, uh, to this meeting. I found a concept that says it's necessary that we build around us space kind spaces. So the concept of kind space is introduced. What I mean by this is how can we make that our society be turned into a kind space? How can we turn our city into a kind space? For example, discrimination, poverty, that goes against a kind space. The lack of citizen rights that goes against this concept. A policy that's against the environment that's 
also goes against the kind space concept. So I would say that what was said in the French Revolution, liberty, freedom, fraternity, I think there was a huge development in the aspects of how to create freedom. But the French Revolution did not how to did not know how to address uh, the fraternity issue, which in the end has to do with love. So what I would like to propose here is a paradigm. How do we make the love be the center of this of our societies, and how do we create kind spaces? Let's move the debate. Nowadays we're debating, at least in Latin America, we're debating that if the state should be the center of development or maybe the free market, why don't we say let's try to make kind spaces and make sure that love and everything that comes out of it will be done to organize education, health, equality, tolerance, and to organize all our citizens' lives. It, it, it sounds a lot like an, an utopia, but we should feed the utopias in our continent in a, in a more global way. This is not something I'm making up. This is a young man who blew himself up for freedom, for democracy. And I found this concept among some of his writings. The obligation, the duty of creating around us um, kind spaces. And I think that's important. I think that's a huge change. This is what I would like to tell the meeting of foreign presidents. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'd like to make a pause. Uh, Mr. Avalo Coron, the president, will have to leave. He already announced it, so I hope we can say goodbye to him the way he deserves, please, with an applause. And going back to some of the topics, we were talking a little bit about the French Revolution. Thank you, Mr. President Colon. One of the discussions in the region was equality, and we have the honor of having one of the few female presidents of all the region. President, what was that relationship with power? How do you see the stereotypes nowadays? Even though we now have the tendency of talking about uh, women and having spaces for women, What can you share with us regarding the challenges that we have in order to get more equality? Uh, good afternoon. I wanted to thank uh, the major on behalf of all the presidents. The way we were welcomed in this warm country. Thank you very much to all of you for being with us this afternoon. And in this effort, which I think that has a lot of experience in it, and humbleness and generosity, I love the way this forum started because the concepts that we've been reiterating are concepts of solidarity when we talk about poverty. We also have the concepts of compassion, of fraternity, and even the concept of love. This was also present here. So I truly think that somehow we are aware of the beautiful intentions that are behind this convention. I congratulate the presidents that mentioned this. Regarding equality, and since tomorrow, I'll have the chance to talk about gender equality. And I hope you can all come here to listen to me. I would uh, 
uh, try to talk a little bit about poverty, competitiveness, sustainability, and what's essential that where is that in the region? Because we've had a change in paradigms in development. And development is different to what it was before. It's not enough to just talk about the GDP of the country or to talk about the uh, material richness of the nations. Every day we have more development as a mixture, as, as a delicate balance of factors that uh, fill the spaces, not just material spaces, but also intellectual, social, and spiritual. There is a factor that is fundamental, and somehow I think this was anticipated by one of the questions that Olinda said to Mr. President Colon, who just left. Just as Mr. Colon said, if there is an asset that is fundamental to our countries, to our nations, is the young people, that young human resource that we have. What they tell us today is that it doesn't matter if a country is big or small. It doesn't matter if a country has a lot of natural uh, richness or um, the, the richness that is really built is the one we have when we talk about human resources. And we've been having a golden decade in Latin America. Some people are saying that this will not be repeated because there aren't any projections like the ones we had the last decade. We also have a challenge of the growth we still have a poverty sector, but we still have a vulnerable sector that will go backwards in some moment. But Latin America in that procedure of growth did something fundamental, which is to understand the value of education, understand the value of investing in its people, because any challenge that we must, that, that we might set the challenges of weather or climate change and the importance of sustaining the environment, the solidarity challenges, the love challenges, all of them without a doubt will have as a response the investment in education. We have invented as a social instrument to generate richness and to create understanding among human beings. So the message that I wanted to give, si bien es cierto, if that when we look back, we see what has happened in Latin America. We have reasons to be optimistic. And when we look forward, we have challenges and some clouds or storm clouds. But we we have a lot of potential, we have young people, and we have the great will which is transformative from the investment in inclusion that will have to be sustained against all odds within the next years. Thank you, President. Well, and without a doubt, we're all learning a lot, and the region has certain challenges education, that sustainable investment on education leads us to ask ourselves how can we make collective agreements, nation agreements that could allow us to carry out the objectives. Not long ago, uh, an entrepreneur in, in the United States was saying that he was surprised how little was the solidarity from Latin America, from the society and some of the steps that had to be taken. So how do you see this, Mr. President? How do we make more progress in the agreements that we have? 
for example, Uruguay is one of the prominent uh, countries that are very well in education wise. Look, we are like like the old guy, the old people from the tribe. Except for except for the president of Costa Rica, then then the older ones we are the old the old people of the tribes that get together uh, to give our opinions, and we have that virtue, just like all older people. Let's start with the utopies that are indispensable and necessary, and then after that, and then we come to the land, to the the old. The old pragmatism. So we are, we are full of possibilities to give advice because we have been through a lot of things as presidents. We have always gotten the, the worst. It, it, it is difficult to give advice. It is not easy to give advices. The first questions that a president in duty is asking is, is what the advice is, what should, I, what, what should he do? And he says, uh, why didn't you do it? So one practical thing that we can still tell people, so not just presidents, but ourselves and all the world and everybody. When the sun rises, Everybody goes out to work. I, I hope that's the way it is. And when we go out to work from from our houses, it, it's it's as if we were exporting our knowledge, our work. And if we manage to, for someone to buy our, our knowledge and our work, then w then we bring then we bring home things that are that we and our children need to live and to grow to get better to improve our lives. Because all, all the countries are the same, just like the families. Right now, we in America, the, the, the first thing that we need to try to do, practically, is to, is to try to, is to try to be part of the new world that is being born. Ten years ago, some people in a country of Europe, or or in other countries of Europe, th there was there was a, a country with a terrible crisis. It was a big disaster. All the youth were um, out of work. In 2004, they started a new a new product that 10 years later landed on a, on a comet, where where it sent pictures from there. And where it says that they that they that they discover some factories and some signs of life. Also, a few years ago, because this is a, this is what we saw. At, at least, at least me, I I in the morning, I I read I read what happens in the world on my tablet. There is no more room. There is no more time. Therefore. We are living in a civilization, uh, a planetary civilization, and if we in America, it, it, it doesn't matter how many young people there are, it doesn't matter how much expect expectations we had and how many utopies we, we dreamed of, if we don't integrate that world that is moving at a very, that, that is moving at an unmeasurable scientific speed, then we are left out of the picture. Then I am a topic, but also I am also practical. F quick, we should integrate the world quickly, because because since we are not producing that science, not yet at least, and that technology at least, not yet at least, and also not a philosophy. Well, well, as somebody said, let them invent, but we are going to get in. We are going to get in there too. Because if we stay outside, you see what happens with our young people now? They, they are divided in two categories. The ones that learn and the ones that know and learn leave, and the ones that don't, they suffer. Part of part of the of the building of this utopies and also the pragmatism that the decision maker requires and and which uh, of which you already know a lot of 
is also the places, common places, such as that take us to convince us that we need to, that we have smaller dimensions, we have, a, we are a small country, and this is what's keeping, what's dragging us down. And this is an example that is coming, that is, uh, that is coming with, with all the visitors that we have here today. Fifty years ago, the the internal domestic product of of South of South Korea was smaller, was lower than than all other the Latin American countries. It was lower than all the Latin American countries. However, and now with technology that was mentioned here, right now South Korea is 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 register more more pat patents than than all the Latin American countries to combine. So if there is one thing that we're not doing in Latin America is to promote the creativity so that we that can that we can allow that will allow us to join that technological de development. What can countries do? How can we convince ourselves that we have a spaces? There are many people that, that have identified themselves to see uh, environments that, that are that are convenient for the development of technology in, in Latin America. I get the impression that that the challenges related to the innovation and creativity that that are related to to education in quantity and about all education of quality. Are are met with some realities that that are uh, that, that have to be taken into account today. In this context, Latin America is a country is a is a continent of peace without a doubt, but we also know this is a continent in which in which not having wars. The, the highest the, the highest level of violence is generated even though there there are no wars the most violent cities in the world 18 are in Latin America and the five in the in the top five Latin in the five top most violent cities are in Latin America there is a paradox here one paradox that has to do with with a popul with a young population that that extraordinary that extraordinarily interesting part of the population facing a reality of a youth that is trapped in the circuit of violence this meeting has to do as fundamental base the defense of values the defense of principles the building of a society on values and principles facing two monsters that are attacking dramatically South, South America, uh, Latin America. That monster is, is organized crime and the monster of corruption. Organized. organized crime and corruption are that have that have broken all uh, borders, that have crossed all borders. Organized crime, not not just in smaller countries that seem that that look um, weak to face them, but also in in cities and countries such as Mexico, a country with 120 million uh, inhabitants, with a very historical in a very rich um, historical culture, that all of a sudden are facing a challenge, be before which. You can see weaknesses, structural weaknesses, insti institutional institutional weaknesses of education, we structural weaknesses, not just in society and in the structure of the of political, but in, in the entire co joint group of those elements that are built, that build a society, starting with the media and also the stereotypes or the models that, that have to follow. Just to mention the Mexican example, not because it's an exceptional case, but because it's, because it's one of the biggest Latin, Latin American countries, the second actually, is facing this reality. The, the, the issue of corruption that is affecting all of us, if, if politicians and, and policies, Latin American policies, are not are not capable of understanding that we represent a model that is not that is not the model that people want to follow. We are not going to understand that there are challenges dr dramatic against democracy that are that are putting putting the cre credibility and legitimacy in in danger.
democracy in, South, in Latin America has consolidated as a, as a mechanism and it should become a lifestyle. But democracy in, in Latin America is facing tensions, the most important tensions facing the world, the, the future. And we need to ask ourselves what it is that we're going to do with political parties, with their behavior, with uh, avoiding uh, avoiding uh, political parties to just become machines in electoral times, trying to find answers, more effective answers for what the, the society expects from them. But something that's very important is the processes of integration that are part of the historical challenge that are happening here. Like President Dualde was saying, these are unavoidable roads. We should also think about the integration to fight about uh, corruption and organized crime. We're not talking just about, and this is fundamental, not just economy. I mean, economy is really important. It is the commerce, opening the markets, of course that is fundamental. But also, we need to start giving answers to the, to the, to the jobs that, we're, that we've been doing wrong in the past decades to, to face organized crime the traffic of weapons etc that that has not worked and that require a, a different a different approach this is a challenge for latin america this is a ch fundamental challenge that is based on the that, that we need to that based on the values the difference between what we say and what we do is brutal in Latin America. The difference in what we preach and what we and what we are able to show with an example is so big that nobody believes us. If there is one thing that politicians have to gain back is the capacity that our word has has value and credibility. And the way to do that and is based on an education based on values and principles that have to do with a base of, of society, with children that have to do with an adequate use of technology, but above all, with an administration of the political uh, duty. The politicians, politicians have to be mo have to be able to transmit that transformation. Uh, my last words uh, and about this question: We will not be the most adequate. The, the most adequate people to work on the, uh, uh, even a company that innovation, innovation is also an, is also an innovation in the behavior. There is no doubt that science and technology are two challenges that, that are still pending in Latin America. But fa but seeing in Latin America that are facing the biggest challenge in their history, if there are two history, besides of course health and education, that of course we cannot separate one from the other, that have to do with the fight against organized crime which is a superstructure that is stronger than states and, of, and therefore our answer has to be from the states to establish uh, answers that are clear with no fear. And with no fear means that we're going to discuss the, the subject of drugs, we're going to talk about without, we're going to find words without any prejudice. And we're also going to fight against corruption, being able to, to, to finish we also need to be able to to believe in our justice, to have a, a system that is um, ruthless, not not in terms of vengeance, but in terms of administration of proper responses for who, for from the people from the government have done what they shouldn't have done, and they're still around like innocent people. These are challenges. That are fundamental challenges. There is no possibilities of a society with innovation, with technology and awareness, if they are not uh, citizen security in their politicians. If they don't, if they don't have a, if they don't behave a believable justice with a justice that is believable, so we will not be able to talk about democracy. Thank you, President Mesa. Very illustrative uh, co comment. So uh, now I give you President Dualde. He has been reflecting on the topics of integration, but also regarding all the inquiries that have been presented this afternoon. President, thank you. Thank you, partners, Dr. Moon, journalists, dear friends, everybody. First of all, I would like to congratulate the last presenter, 
in for putting into in perspective the the real risk of the region do you know dr moon that Latin america is a, is a continent of peace however as it was mentioned before violence has has taken has taken place here and there are and one of the topics that was discussed here and two more topics have been added dr mesa which are what we, what we worry about. We are the continent with the, with the highest um, unvalence, the, the biggest unvalence. We, we have known them for 30 years, and for 30 years we've been talking about this. So let's get to work. What do we have to do? I've been saying this unsuccessfully. When I was the governor of my province, the Buenos Aires province, and this is a success that did not continue, I, to guarantee the people the the guarantee to own land it, it is a shame that in this Latin America that is that is not fully populated people have to people have to steal a piece of land to to build our, our life project this is shameful it's a defect of our of our pre predecessors and we need to finish that that shameful and and it's not even expensive to do it's not even expensive to do that do you know how much it costs to to lose your roots in, in your land to leave your land because you have because you don't have not anything to do there of course this is not only only being linked to your land this is also it's it's about generating jobs and more work when we talk about organized crime this is really this is the highest risk that, w that democracy has in, in Latin America. It's not 30 or 40 or 50 years in which the United States has believed that, th that the phenomenon of the drugs will be, will be solved f uh, after the war. And since Nixon that declared war and then after 10 years after that, they said that they, they had lost it. Well, they say they lost, but then Reagan came, and, and he doubled the bet. He doubled the, and, and he and he also lost it. We also lost it because because the mistake is to believe that that the topics of men are solved with violence. That that is a basic mistake. In my case, I was I I've been saying this f to President or the President of the United States, first to Vice President Quayne. I w I was. 30 years ago, 30, 35 years ago, I, I, I was pretending to have an alliance, a continental alliance, to, to deal with this, with the phenomenon of the drugs. And then when, when Bush, when the first Bush came, in, in those times, he was, I was vice president of the country, and I told him the same thing. I said, Atten attention, we're, we're, we're wrong, because the problem is the men. The problem is not is not the, the inert element which is drugs. No, the problem is the man. And now when men, when everything is falling down, when everybody knows the truth, when there is a paradigm in the United States, because President Obama is acknowledging that the President of the United States says uh, he's, that he's fighting with an arm that is tied to his hand, because the budget he has to, for the prevention and, and dealing of, of addicts, of drug addicts, is, is miserable, then, then it makes it clear how, how, how bad this problem is. But luckily, the paradigm in the United States changes. But when that happens, there are other, why, why are people, because they're not giving import, importance to what universities in the United States have been saying. All the most important universities in the United States were saying that the problem is not solved with violence. But, but as we know, politicians, we, we go ahead with the, with the issue of war. And now when everything is falling down, when everything we know is not true, then why don't we ask the universities if we need to, if we need to set, if we need to, to set the drugs, um, to, to make f drugs legal? And if we change uh, drugs for the legalization of drugs, then we leave the most important, the most important topic, which is men. It's always been men, men in his problems, because this world is more, uh, is more materialistic every year. More ge new generations that are not as advised as, as the other president is not 
women used to transmit culture, the mother, the, the female teacher, the second mother in the school, that, that's in our culture, that we use a humanist. And today we need to talk about, to, to gain back a, a power that, which is the moral power, because if we don't get back that power, science and technology are advancing at such a rate, and, and we don't notice that, that our children so capable of, of using these technological devices, they can. They, they should always. They, they should also uh, carry moral values, and also the other problem. The the problem that that really that has to do with values. The corruption problem that is that is installed in in the bigger or smaller scale in other of our countries, and along with organized crime. I can tell you now, and I I am writing a book. So, and this is this is a book that I'm writing on this topic, and that topic is is the corruption related to drug dealing. That book is going to be called so "Thinking About Clinton." Is is the man stupid? It's not violence. It's not the legalization. It, it's taking care of the new generations that are that are with the truth completely completely twisted with, with no future. So what happens in my country, that I am sure can happen in, in our neighbor countries, is 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 um, is very bad. So if, if we don't get it back, the future is not going to be the future that we want. Thank you.